Hi, my name is Matt, and this is my wife, Sherry. We're the pastors at Eagle Creek Church. And our hope is that from the moment you and your family step through the doors of any of our locations, you know that you are loved, that you're valued, and that you belong here. Something you'll learn very quickly here is that we exist to empower people to be exactly who God created them to be. But that all starts with each of us deeply knowing God who created us. So every week, our prayer is that you will encounter God in a really meaningful way through powerful times of worship and sermons that are really rooted in God's truth and can easily be applied to your life. From the beginning, our church has felt a call to reach and empower families. So we put a lot of time and energy into creating an environment that helps you and your family grow in their relationship with God every week. And trust us, your kids will love it. We have an incredible service, tailor-made for your kids, birth through fifth grade, that will include object lessons and crazy games and high-energy worship, all with the goal of leading them to their very own relationship with Jesus. We also have an amazing student ministry where each week students 6th through 12th grade will experience engaging worship and dynamic and relevant Bible-based messages, incredible times of community, and so much more. We believe that church, when it is done right, feels like a family. So we place a high emphasis on helping you find a group of people to do life with, whether it's through one of our weekly community groups or taking your next step, maybe by serving on a ministry team. We want to help you find others to share and serve and grow with here. We also passionately believe that the church is not just a building, it's a people. And God has called us to be a church that reaches out to a hurting and lost world with compassion and the love of God through global missions, through serving our local community, and generously giving to make a difference in our world with the good news of Jesus. Well, once again, we are so thankful for you, and we hope that you know that this is a place where you belong. Welcome home. exists to worship its creator God. Did you know that you were created to worship your creator God? We're giving everything over to God first as an offering of worship, as a sacrifice of ourselves, saying, Lord, whenever I come in and I begin to worship you, I was created to be a worshiper. There's a relationship connection that happens in worship uniquely because God designed the human soul to worship its creator. You were made for worship. Well, good morning, church. Welcome. We're glad you joined us. Will you stand? Hey, if it's your first time at Eagle Creek, we're glad you joined us. We love worshiping the Lord here. We're just going to come into his presence. Thank you for who he is and everything he's done for us. So let's sing. battle you see my victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me
God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go
the wonderful, the powerful name of Jesus. Amen, church? That's why we're here this morning, because Jesus forgives sins, and Jesus breaks chains, and Jesus saves souls from hell, amen? I may not know much, but I know this, there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's lift him up together.
like the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Over anything you are walking through, would you do this with me? Say, Jesus. Say, Jesus. I believe in you. I know you have power for my situation, for my family, for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We serve an all-powerful God. Amen. Amen. I love worshiping with you in this place. Man, wow. No matter what you're walking through, you just keep saying that name, Jesus. Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for worshiping. You guys can go ahead and be seated today. We're glad to have you out on this beautiful, sunny, sunny morning. If today is one of your very first or your very first time joining us here at Eagle Creek, uh, I just wanted to invite you to do something. As soon as service ends, there's a table in the lobby that says new here, really big on the wall, and we have a special gift for you there. And so if you're here and you haven't had a chance to stop at the new here booth, please feel free to do that after service today. Also, if you could take a moment in the next few moments and fill out your connect card. Let us know you're here, how we can be praying for you, or maybe you're ready to to take some of your next steps in your faith journey. Go ahead and mark that down on your card and you can place it in the offering bucket in just a moment here when those go by. But we thought we would take a second this morning and kind of highlight a ministry that you guys don't get to see on Sunday mornings. It happens on Wednesday nights and so many of you will not ever really be in the building at the same time or haven't been and so you don't know what's happening with our teens here at Eagle Creek. So we want you guys to check out a short video to just show you what God's doing among our teens here at Eagle Creek. guys give it up for what God's doing in our teens. It's so exciting. So um, if you aren't aware of our youth program, they meet on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8 o'clock right here in this room out in the lobby. It is a ton of fun. Anywhere between about 80 and 120 kids every Wednesday night having a blast, 6th through 12th graders. But our youth pastors are up here on the front row. Can you guys stand up really quick? Uh, this is Noah and Emmy, and I'm having them stand because, yeah, you can clap for them. That's a good idea. We love them. We love them so much, but I wanted you guys to see them because after service, if you have a teen and maybe you're like, man, I wanna get my teen plugged into this program. I need to hear more about it. Come and talk to these guys. Or maybe you're here and you're like, I love teens. Sign me up. How do I become a small group leader or a worker with the teens? Come and talk to these guys. They'll be out here in the lobby all day. Thank you guys. Just since, you can go ahead and be seated. Um, just since January, they've had 78 teens who've either made their very first decision to follow Christ or have rededicated their lives to Christ, 78, just in the last few months. God is on the move. We've had tons of teens who've said, man, God is healing me from kind of past pain and hurt. Some physical healings have been taken. I mean, like God is moving in our teens. They have a worship culture that is just, un I mean, they, they worship, they're passionate about God. So this summer, there's a couple of things. If you have teens, I wanted you to know about high school teens. We have an internship program. They can come and be a part of that this summer. They'll tell you about it if, if they're going into their freshman year all the way through high school graduates. Fantastic opportunity. They're going to summer camp, and it's going to be an awesome week of camp together. They're going to Ensenada, Mexico on a missions trip. So if you have teens and you have any questions, come talk to these guys. But they would also love young adults and adults who just want to pour into young lives. And if that's you, we have some amazing youth sponsors that are here in this room right now. They would love to have you join the team as well. So we just wanted to let you guys know there's a couple of 
things coming up this week we wanted to let you know about. The first one is Serve Our City Day is this Saturday. Many of you are already signed up for a project, and there's a few more you can get signed up for on here. There's 14 projects to choose from. But the other thing is your T-shirts are out in the lobby if you ordered one. So go ahead and pick those up on your way out today, and we cannot wait for Saturday to serve all over the KC region together. Next Sunday, we also have something called Connect. Everybody say Connect. I want you to hear me on this one. If you're at the church and you have never gone through Connect, we want you to come join us next Sunday, okay? It's during the 1030 service. It's an opportunity to hear how you can get plugged in at the church. So many people walk through the back doors of the church, come in, sit down, enjoy church, and get up and walk out. And they're like, man, I don't really know people here. How do I get plugged in? We want to help you. They're like, how do I start serving? What does that look like? How do I figure out what the church believes? All of those things, check it out at the Connect class next Sunday. You can mark your card and we'll give you some more information in, uh, over the course of the week so you can be a part of that next Sunday. And then the very last thing I wanted to let you guys know about is Mother's Day is coming so, uh, Sunday, May 12th, and we're going to have a super special day planned for all of the women of Eagle Creek Church. Everything from special treats to a special gift to a family photo spot that you guys can be a part of, and then a message that's just tailored towards women. Sorry guys for that day, um, but we would love to have you and your extended family here with us on Mother's Day. So go ahead and just be planning that now. Start inviting away uh, for that day. We're gonna allow you guys to give back to God through your tithes, through your offering this morning. And as you do, ushers, you guys can go ahead and kind of make your way forward. As you prepare your gifts, you can give here in person or you can give online. I just wanna take this morning and thank God for what he is doing in our youth program. I know that sometimes we're like, well, where does my money go You know, when I, when I give? One of the things that, that your money does, it is it allows us to minister to teens right where they're at, to be able to pay for games for them to play or to, to, to pay for the discipleship materials so that, that we can teach the kids the word of God right where they're at. And so I just wanna say thank you for your faithfulness in giving your regular tithes. Because you tithe, we get to have a youth program that's reaching and seeing 78 teens committing their lives to Christ over the last few months. So thank you, thank you. Continue to be praying for our teens here at Eagle Creek and in our community. But will you do this? Let's pray for those um, that are here at Eagle Creek and those that aren't even here yet that are teens this morning as we give. Lord, this morning, we thank you for the opportunity to present the gospel to, to teenagers, to young, uh, uh, young lives, Lord. They aren't the, the church of the future, they're church right now, they are the church. And Lord, I pray that we would impact their lives, that the word of God, God would go out boldly, that we would be able to disciple them, that we would be able to see their lives transform, not just this Wednesday night or next, but for an entire eternity, that their lives would be surrendered to you. I pray your blessing on the rest of this morning and on this offering. May it continue to provide for the needs of Eagle Creek, but also be a blessing around the world. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You guys can go right ahead. If you could ask Jesus anything, what would you ask him? I would probably ask, are you really the savior or should I just keep looking? I would like to know how to forgive someone who just keeps on hurting me. With all the lies out there today, how are we supposed to know what is really true anymore? Where was he when I needed him? I would like to know what loving your neighbor is supposed to look like today in our incredibly polarized society. What would it take to be great in your eyes? If you could ask Jesus anything, what would you ask him? We want to thank you for being here as we're continuing on to week two of our series, Questions for Jesus. And I want to welcome everyone at our Warrensburg campus this morning. Great to have all of you with us and online as well. We're always glad for online church um, being a part of what God's doing here and growing in the Word together. And so uh, for the next several weeks, we're going to be asking questions that people ask of Jesus. We're going to be uh, reiterating those and then saying, how did Jesus respond? How does that apply to our life? And so we're focusing on this question of how do I forgive someone who just keeps on hurting me? Have you ever been burned at a level where in the moment, in the pain, when it's happened, 
it feels nearly impossible to forgive that person. Like your brain cannot wrap itself around forgiveness in the moment. I mean, you, someday you'll get there, but right now, you're a long ways from being there. In that moment, you're, I've been there, and I'm a guy who preaches on forgiveness. I'm the pastor, but let me tell you, now, how many of you know that pastors are people too? And we get wounded, and we get hurt, and people offend us like they offend you, and that's you know, all the same sort of thing. And whenever that happens, there are moments where I can preach and talk and quote the verses all about forgiveness, and it doesn't matter what I say in my heart, I'm stressed and angry and upset and vindicating myself and arguing with that person, and my blood pressure's up and I can't sleep at night. Anyone? That sound familiar? Same thing, same thing. So I, I know what that's like, and I get to go through that at times, and probably, how many of you suspect that you might get to face the issue of unforgiveness and forgiveness at least one more time before you die? That, it's just gonna happen. That's the reality, is people are people, and people hurt each other, right? And, and I don't wanna be negative, but I've just lived long enough to say, that's kind of a reality, and it happens in families, it happens in workplaces, it happens in friend groups, uh, it happens in churches, it happens on, you know, soccer teams between parents. I remember one of the parents in a soccer team being shouted off the soccer field by his own team because he was yelling at a 16-year-old ref relentlessly when my daughter was like, you know, eight years old, she's now getting married, you know, um, my youngest one. And how many of you know that guy probably carried bitterness for bit, getting yelled off the, you know, and he got kicked out and all that sort of stuff. But there was some bitterness going on on that field in the soccer. So it doesn't even matter if it's sports. So any of you sports families know that parents get mad at coaches for not playing their kid? How many of you have ever refed a game and had parents yelling at you like you were Satan himself? And so it doesn't matter where you are, these environments of anger and yelling and then the bitterness that's caused and, you know, things said about people that should never be said. And this kind of stuff is part of the world that we live in. And so we're going to have to be able to approach this in a healthy way. Now, um, I, I do want to just pause and take a little side thing that some people aren't really going to love. Um, there's a difference between a wound and a perceived wound. Now, a wound is a violation of the teachings and the principles of Scripture that inflict harm on someone, and that person then receives that action as harmful. A perceived wound is the person has in no way violated the principles or teachings of Scripture, but you don't like what they did. That's a perception of wrong rather than an actual wrong. How many of you can have a perception of wrong and say, I know what you meant, you were saying that I'm this, and then your spouse says, I was not trying to, I, oh my goodness, I did not mean that by what I said. And all of a sudden you realize you had a perceived wrong and not a real wrong, okay? A guilty, come on, someone raise your hand. You're not, I'm not the only spouse that's done that, right? Okay, perceived wrong versus real wrong. But how many of you know that you can have perceived wrongs towards almost anyone and you can sometimes be wrong about the wrong? Okay. And so with that, that's a different issue to work through. And so rather than, yeah, you need to be forgiving, but you also need to grow up. Okay. And stop being so defensive and perceiving everything as a wrong against you. So that might be a different issue of maturity um, and so sometimes we'll throw perceived wrongs into the pile of real wrongs, and then we're working through the process that isn't really the process we need to be working on. We need to be working on something different. So I challenge you to look at your perceptions of wrong as I get into today's message, because I'm afraid you'll take what I say and apply it to someone who only did a perceived wrong and say, and Pastor Matt told me so, and I don't want to be guilty of you doing something dumb. Okay, so I just want you to know that right up front. In fact, Proverbs 27, 6 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Some of the wounds I've had were actually not wounds at all. I just didn't like someone telling me what I was doing was wrong and painful and sinful, and so I wanted to vilify the messenger because I didn't want to deal with me. 
And tell me I'm not the only one guilty of that one. Okay, so, so that can happen, and I'm trying to vilify you because I don't, you're making me look at me, and I don't want to look at me in that way. I want to think I'm right and you're wrong. And so the reality is sometimes I'll twist your words and make you say more than you said and take them out of context and try to get a bunch of people on my side and mad at you for saying something so terrible to me when in fact it was wounds from a friend and they should have been trusted and I should have worked through them. So we got to work through that as well. But we'll get right down to the big point. Okay, so we have people that have actually hurt us for no good reason. They kicked our sandcastle over. They were that kid when they grew up. They didn't build sandcastles. They just kicked everyone else's over, okay? And so you ran a run in with one of the kick the sandcastle over, knock the stack of blocks over people, okay? And they just knocked your stack of blocks over. They kicked your sandcastle. You didn't deserve it, and you're hurt. And it's bigger than the sandcastle. And this, you know, I'm not downplaying. The wound is real. It's big. It's significant. And it should have never happened. So what are we going to do to get over that? And I know it's hard to do that immediately. I'm not saying instantly in the moment it happens, you have to forgive from the heart completely and it's all done. I know that I'm human, you're human, and that doesn't necessarily happen that easily. It's a more of a process. So I'm going to talk to you through a process that Jesus gives and then a heart that Jesus says to have and then a parable that pulls it together, okay? Those are the three things I'm going to do. And so I want to start into the process because at first we want to start with saying, can it be restored? Can this relationship be, that's broken right now, it feels very broken. Can I restore the relationship is the first approach that Jesus would give us. And so how do we restore something that's broken? Number one, let's just look at this. Restoration requires transparent truth. It's so important that believers care enough to see other believers own their sin. Like, you're caring about the person that wronged you. If they're a Christian, it doesn't mean you don't care about them if they're not a Christian, but there's a different sort of requirement on us as brothers and sisters. How many of you know when it's in your family, it's your brother, your sister, your mom or dad, biologically, you got to try extra hard to try to restore family relationships that are broken because they're part of your life for forever, Right? For the rest of your life, they should be probably part of your life. There's only extreme circumstances where that can be, you know, changed with whatever. And we'll kind of get there. Um, Christian brothers and sisters are part of our eternal family. And so it's incumbent on us to do our best to restore broken relationships with Christian brothers and sisters because we have the same father, the father God. We have the same eternal home, heaven. You're going to bump into each other sometime in the next billion years. Okay? And by then your heart will be transformed and glorified and you won't be unforgiving and all that. But we need to work on it. And so what are we supposed to do? How are we going to work on it? Jesus gives three healing steps um, that the church doesn't talk about much today. Um, And I think when we do, and when we have in the past, it's been sort of out of the context of Scripture. And so I'm going to talk about these steps in the context that Jesus would have been referring to. Matthew 18, 15. Matthew 18, 15. It says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Now, how many of you just stop right there and you're like, yeah, not going to do that? Okay. I know people are going to opt out on several of these steps along the way. But I'm just going to tell you, it's what Jesus said, so there's probably a good reason for it. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Wait, I don't normally go tell people their faults. I normally tell other people about their faults. You mean Jesus isn't on board with that approach? It doesn't look like it. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The end. Restored. No one else included. How many say, that might be helpful if we started to do that sometimes? Okay. But how many of you will admit, we usually don't? Not raising our hands, are we? Okay. So let's go on. So let's say that doesn't work. And by the way, I'll mention Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, spiritually minded, not spiritually perfect. Can I get that down? How many of you know no one's spiritually perfect? Spiritually minded is like, I'm trying to keep a vision 
of spiritual objectives for people in my life. Spiritually minded should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So we're going to go about it in the right way. So you offended me and I don't even feel like I can be your friend anymore. And don't say all the ridiculous stuff. Keep it calm. Get it together. Wait till you're ready to approach it. So if that doesn't work, um, let's go to verse 16. Verse 16, Jesus says, but if you done listen, take two, one or two others along with you. Why? Why should you do that? This is, once again, not normally something we do. Why should we do that? That every charge, so you're saying they did something to you, and, and maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Maybe you have a perceived wrong, and it's not a real wrong. And the nice thing, if you can get a couple other people, that you may, it may be, every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So these other people can say, wait, wait, wait. Don't go to them and confront them. You're overreacting. I don't even think they probably meant that. I know them. In fact, I was there. I heard it's established by two or three witnesses. I was right there. I don't think they meant anything by that. I think this is a total overreaction. And so the charge is now disestablished by two or three witnesses. And you learn to cool your jets. And they're like, calm it down. We'll talk. But I think we're okay here. You know? How many of you know a lot of things could be handled if there was someone else that heard the conversation that cooled you down a little bit? And maybe the person says, yeah, that was pretty bad. Ugh. And you say, I talked to him, and they totally denied and act like they didn't do it, and, and they're still talking to me this way and acting this way about me. Would you mind helping me talk to them about this? And the two of you say, hey, what's going on? Why, why are you acting this way? I mean... You totally said this to them. That's really painful. And I guess they talked to you about it. And you didn't really see it. But I, I mean, I was there. I saw this. And then that's just not right. As Christians, we don't really talk to each other and treat each other this way. We're supposed to be humble and show love to one another. And, you know, all these things. So you, you walk them through this, okay? I mean, we'll say, well, step number two seems like an even further stretch. Well, it goes a little deeper. Let's look at step number three. Let's go to the next portion, verse 17. If he refuses to listen to a couple folks talking to him, then tell it to the church. The Greek word is the ecclesia. We'll talk about that in a moment. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, there's a couple interpretations of this. And I'll try to stick, if I can, with maybe the best cultural interpretation. First of all, I just want to stop and say, this restorative process is for the church, not for the family. Why do I say that? Because you don't get to kick your 10-year-old child out for sassing you. And say, I talked to him, his father and I have both talked to him, and he's still sassing me, and we're going to have the whole family meeting, we can kick him out. How many say... Probably not for the family context, but there are principles that could be applied, you know, principles that could be applied, like talking and have these conversations and having people weigh in on it, and then some form of consequence that's appropriate to the 10-year-old, other than ostracizing him from the family, okay? So there's, there's probably some balance in here, some things to learn, but in the specific context, the word ecclesia, it means a gathering or an assembly or a congregation, um, in verse 20, by the way, just a few verses later, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Like two or three could be a gathering of believers? Yeah, it could be an ecclesia, two or three. You mean this could be handled not just by a church that has an official name that has to be called like First Baptist Church, First Methodist Church, Eagle Creek Church, or whatever. It, it doesn't have to have a title with a pastor. It could be a gathering of believers, well, that's what it said. It said the ecclesia, the gathering of a group of believers. So like, just like our friend group could maybe handle this friend, well, yeah, wouldn't that be far more restorative than bringing them up in front of a bunch of strangers? Someone give me an amen on that. I mean, it would be far more restorative to have a family meeting and say, hey, listen, what you've been doing to so-and-so and saying to so-and-so and the way you've been acting you're a Christian man, and you can't be acting and treating someone this way. This is wrong. And uh, a couple of us, we've been trying to talk to you, and listen, you just can't continue to do this. How many say that's 
maybe more in the context of what Jesus is doing here. In fact, the early churches, which hadn't even formed in Jesus' time, but the early churches that gathered were, and so is Jesus referring to the formal church that had gathered? There wasn't yet a formal church that had gathered when Jesus taught this. He had not yet died on the cross and resurrected in the book of Acts uh, when the church is formed by the apostles. There, that, none of that had happened yet. So he's literally referring to a small gathering of people that believe in his name, that he's the Christ. And so in this context, it says there's a time where you say to that person, listen, we need you to be separated for a period of time so that you can process and be restored. And you're not getting it. You're not getting how detrimental, how painful, how sinful, how harmful, how, how much woundedness you're causing to other people by your behavior. And everyone's trying to get through to you. I mean, all of us, all six of us sitting here just talked to you and said, this is what you're doing and you can't see it and you won't respond and you won't change. And so you're not invited back next Thursday night until you get it together because we're not going to bring you into a place to cause destruction to other believers until you stop it. Does that make a little more sense? It makes a lot of sense in context, especially when you look at other scripture. If you, By the way, the early church was only gatherings of 10, 15, 20 people in people's homes. We're like, well, the church back then, the church back then met in homes with 10 to 15 to 20 people. That's what the church back then was. There were not brick and mortar church buildings in the first century. Did you know that? There weren't brick and mortar church buildings. They were meeting in homes. So putting this in the context of what is really happening here. And so you're trying to restore a person. You're bringing some confrontation to them. You're trying to do this in a spirit of meekness and uh, with a good attitude because you want to bring some relationship back and you're hoping this person will be able to receive this from you. So Jesus is helping to create a plan for full spiritual and relational restoration for someone. That's his goal is restoration. The goal, people are, it's funny, people read this passage and their whole, their whole concept is, oh, this is all about church discipline and kicking people out of the church. It's like, did you just read the same passage I read? The entire thing is, how do you restore people? How do you restore them? Try again to restore them. They didn't, re they didn't listen. Try again to restore them. They didn't listen. Try again to restore them. Even the excommunication process from a, a group is like, this is a natural consequence to a harmful person to not continue to harm people. We're not going to create the uh, platform for you to wound people here until you get it together. You know, you don't get to show up at the group drunk anymore. Because you really mess up small group when you do that. Okay? So, and all of us have confronted you. We all tried to talk to you and you won't listen. So, you need to just check out until you get your act together. And we're still here. We'll, well, no, you're treating them like a publican, like a tax collector and a Gentile. Did you know that they had to work with tax collectors all the time in their culture? Did you know that the Jewish people... And the Christians in the, uh, sorry, the Christians in the Jewish communities were in constant contact with the other Jews because that's the way they did all their business. It was they were interacting with them all the time. That doesn't mean I have to walk by every Gentile and not talk to them and not be friendly and not pay my taxes. It's like you'll be interacting as you commonly interact in the co community and the culture. But they're not part of the inside community of the believers for a time while we're hoping they'll deal with their stuff. What that may mean for you is that there are people that wound and harm you relationally and you try your very best to restore those relationships and you have the serious hard conversations that you should have. And other people engage with you in those conversations and help to, that are aware, personally and intimately aware of this. And, and we try to have conversations to restore. It doesn't mean you arm yourself with a troop of people to go attack someone and they weren't even part of the conversation. Don't, they're not witnesses. They, they, they have no personal knowledge of it. They're just your friends trying to defend you to someone. That's not what this means. It means people that are intimately aware of this person's character and violation in the situation are coming in and being a part of it. Otherwise, the, the charge cannot be established by two or three witnesses if the people you have are not witnesses. They're just your friends who believe anything you tell them. That's not what this passage means. So you don't get to arm yourself with your own army of people to go attack them. And I got a couple people and we went and got them. 
Okay, tell me about those couple people. Well, they weren't there, but I told them what happened. So this charge is being established by two or three witnesses that are your friends that weren't there that you told what happened. No, that's, that's not the context of this teaching at all. You violated the scriptures, leave it alone. Walk away if you need to. But that's not biblical confrontation. You're not following the teaching of this passage if you do that. So we look at this and we say, now what can we do? What, am, what can I do? I tried. And it's not working. And I just want to be done with them. I'm just washing my hands and I'm treating them like the tax collector and publican. And I don't want to have a relationship. And can I just be done with them? So let's give you the second thought here. Forgiveness requires continued grace. We talked about restoration, the restoration process that we want to have. Restoration requires transparent truth. In other words, you got to own stuff for restoration. I'm not going to be restored to you based on a lie. I never did that to you. Okay, I'm restored because you denied it. That's not, restoration was based on truth. In every instance, truth was required. If they confess, if they own it, if they will listen to the church. If truth will be accepted by that person, restoration of relationship can occur. But what if that person denies truth at every point and will not accept truth from anyone? It's very hard for restoration to be happening based on a lie. How many of you know it's hard to restore a broken relationship on a bunch of lies? Okay? So this is hard, but this is the teaching. This is the teaching of Jesus towards restoration. So now what does he say restoration's not working out very well? Forgiveness requires continued grace. Peter says, well, okay, verse 21. Then Peter came up and, and said <clears throat> to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him as many as seven times. He's feeling probably pretty special when he says as many as seven times. Probably feeling pretty good. Now, it was the common teaching of Jewish Pharisees to teach that you could forgive someone three times. But after that third time, you were free to hold the offense now. If that person continued to act in the same way after the third time, you were free to hold the offense. So Peter, based on Jewish teaching of the time, assesses Jesus and said, Jesus always steps it up. Jesus probably would say four or five times. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to up him one. I know go, go in hot with Jesus. Jesus, I know they say three times. I'm going for seven. What do you think? I'm pretty smart, aren't I? Look at me. I just showed how spiritual I was. Now, Jesus says to him in the next verse, now, Jesus said, I do not say seven times, but I say 77 times. Now, just there's an argument about uh, the Greek construction in this sentence right here. And the question is, does it say 77 times or 7 times 70? And that point, whether it's 77 times or 7 times 70, 490 times, that point's really insignificant either way. Because what Jesus will teach in the parable, he will show, will show that forgiveness is something that continues on and on and on and on infinitely. And that the number is not important, but the heart is important with forgiveness. Amen? And so Jesus is getting to something very deep. And we're going from how do we get restored to how do I deal with my heart when I can't be restored. And I think there's a lot of people that would say... I don't know if I can ever be restored. I think what's broken is like broken, broken. And I don't see a pathway around the brokenness. But the problem is I can't get it out of my heart. And I'm not free. You've heard the quote, forgiveness is to set the prisoner free and realize the prisoner was you. And it's this moment where you realize I'm now captive to the offense and I can't shake free, and I can't be restored, and I'm just stuck in it. And where do I go from here? So Jesus is dealing with this. And we look at this whole concept, and we say, but it's not very forgiving to kick someone out. 
You know, if I'm supposed to forgive, you know, up to seven times, no, seven times 70 or 77 times or infinitely forgiving. But then why did you say to kick someone out, to put them out? I'll give you a real quick couple of verses that just give some context in uh, the Apostle Paul dealing with the teachings of Christ and applying it to a church situation. 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 5. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with you in the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man. He was caught um, having an affair with his father's other wife. So he's, you know, having an affair with his stepmom, basically. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So you're kicking a guy out, delivering him out, excommunicating him with the hope of restoring him by doing that. That's essentially what he's saying, is that there needs to be an ecclesiastical consequence, a gathering of the church consequence for sin, but the reason is not vindication. The reason is not retaliation. The reason is not anger. The heart's not anger. The reason is, what else is it going to take to get through to his heart? What would it take to break this guy of this awful sin? Would he feel the weight of all of us pushing him away and saying, we cannot accept this from you? So that hopefully he understands, Jesus cannot accept this from you. And he'll come back. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, someone has repented. It may be the same guy. It may, some indications may be that it was a different person that's repented. But his response, for such a one, this punishment by the majority, the ecclesia, is enough. So you should rather turn and forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. So there's a time where it gets through, and you're like, it worked. They understand the pain they've caused and the sin that's happened. And what is your goal? To lovingly reaffirm people that are broken by the discipline of the group of believers. Amen? So even if you push someone out, your heart is still open. How do you do that? How do you set up a boundary and push a mother-in-law out because of the damaging, destructive words she's brought into your marriage and your home and towards your children? And, you are, and your husband have said, this cannot continue. She's a believer. We're believers. She's destroying our home. She's de trying to create a wedge. But how do I keep my heart open and keep her out? I don't know how to do that kind of thing. A heart open and a person through consequences kept out. It doesn't feel loving. It doesn't feel right. It's like if I forgive, then I just have to allow him back in or I'm not being forgiving, right? No, that's not right. How many of you know that you can bring consequences on children that you love? So you can love and forgive a child and carry out, um, you know, Sorry, you don't get to be on your phone for the next month. You don't love me. No, I love you. You won't forgive me. If you forgive me, you would give me my phone back, my car back. No, I forgive you. But there will need to be some consequences to restore you to a right, responsive relationship to me as your parent. So these two can coincide. They can work together. And so we try to figure out how to live in this continual state of forgiveness towards people that offend us, while sometimes we can't stay closely connected to him. So what's the perspective? Jesus gives a story to say, here's how, here's how you do this. Here's how you feel this way. Here's how you think this way. Here's what pulls all this together. And this is where I'm gonna end. Here's what pulls this all together. And he tells them a story, he reads them a parable, and I want to go ahead and just read it to you. I'll give you a couple brief explanations as we go so that it, it'll make more sense in context. Matthew 18, 23 through 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
one talent is equal to 20 years of labor for a day labor. Essentially, this is 5,000 lifetimes of work. Because this person, when it says servant, the word is probably more accurately translated a personal slave earning a day's labor. So it's unimaginable to Jesus' audience how this person could have got into that much debt. How's that even possible for a day laborer, for a servant, to get that much from the king? How could he have ever received that much, to be in that much debt? How could he ever pay it off? If he could never pay that off, that's 5,000 lifetimes of work. It's not possible. Verse 25. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, his wife, his children, and all that he had as payment. This was a common practice of the day for those that were in debt. Now, how many of you know all of that still has no chance of paying off 5,000 lifetimes worth of work? So obviously, everyone listening to Jesus is saying, well, that doesn't even cover a fraction of it. That's hardly anything. That's a drop in the bucket. That's nothing, Jesus. Even if you do all that, that's not even comparison. There's no comparison to what he owes. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. He had to forgive the debt because the debt could not be repaid. There was no other way to release him but forgiveness because he could never pay. So he released him because, and he forgave the debt. But the same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii is one day's labor. So this guy owes him for a hundred days labor. So the servant fell down and, and he grabbed him. It says, in seizing him, he began to choke him. And he was saying, pay what you owe. So his servant fell down and pleaded with them, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, everyone listening to Jesus is thinking, yeah, I've known people that ho- owed 100 denarii. That's a, that's a bad situation when you get that far back with someone. But I mean, there's just no way you're gonna send someone to debtor's prison. It's harder to get paid that way. You'd let them work. You'd let them work for you. You'd let them, you can get your money quicker with 100 denarii if they work for you. With 5,000 talents, yeah, they'll never pay you off. Might as well throw them in jail. They're never going to pay you. But they could pay it off eventually with this. He refused, and he went and put him in prison until he should pay all the debt. Now I think the point's becoming very clear to Peter. Peter, I want you to imagine Every sin you've committed against the perfect, sinless God who created you and gave you life and breath and a mind and an occupation and a home and a family and day after day after day, the 10,000 talents that he showered on your life are immeasurable. And you've immeasurably sinned against a God who has immeasurably blessed you. And you have your hands on the throat of someone when you get to time number eight. Seven times I forgave him and now I'm going to strangle him to death. Because he will not do this to me again. And I'll throw him in prison and I'll take his family too. I will take them out. I will destroy his reputation. I will tell everyone thing that everyone what he's done. He will be in prison. Every restaurant he walks into in this town, there will be someone with a scowl on their face. Every business partner that he goes and tries to talk to, I will have got to them first. I will put him in the prison that I can put him in. Every family member of ours will know how he mistreated me, how she talked about me. I will put him in prison. I will strangle the life out of him and I will cut him off from the land of the living with every breath that I have. How many of you have carried that kind of resentment towards someone that you would make them pay everything you could possibly make them pay to everyone you know that knows them? 
your hands around the throat, choking the life out of someone, taking everything you could take from them. And as you do that picture, there's someone standing far, far, far above you, looking at every blessing of your life that he's given you, every moment of grace, every moment of joy, the children you have, the life you've been given, everything was given to you, and you owed him so much. And the one who speaks the parable, Jesus Christ, is imagining, in my mind I can say he's thinking, I know the price that will be paid for the sins you've committed. No debt will go unpaid of yours because I will pay the 10,000 talents. I will pay the thousand lifetimes of sin debt that you owe the Father with my own life and my own death on the cross for you. The one speaking the parable is the one who will be paying your debt. And so is there any room for unforgiveness in the life of the one who's been forgiven by God? through the death of Jesus Christ in your place for your sins, is there any room for continued unforgiveness? None. But is it a hard, painful process that you must be determined to complete the journey to the place of releasing that person? It's a hard, painful process, but it's a process that we must engage in. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to the master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And Jesus concludes his teaching on this. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your what? So if I sense that I have not forgiven from my heart, my journey is not done to forgiveness. If I sense that I still have hands around the throat and I will make them pay every last dime to everyone I know and they know, if I ever had a chance to make them pay, to see them squirm, if that's where I am, hands around the throat, so will the Father do. Maybe that's in reverse. Maybe it's saying, this kind of person can't truly have understood and received the grace and forgiveness of God if they cannot give it because what should be overflowing from the life of the believer who's received grace and forgiveness from God is grace and forgiveness for others. It's almost a question, have you truly received if you cannot give? Or do you still need to receive more of the grace of God the forgiveness of God so that you can finally learn to release others with the grace you've been given. So today, can I invite you to stand with me all across the room? I want us to go through an action of release as we pray. The worship team's gonna come back up and lead us. For some of you, you're not holding on to it much. It's just now and then you have that heart pounding moment where you start thinking about how you were wronged and how you wish they would pay and God why won't you make them pay there's a passage here in Romans chapter 12 I'll just read it real quick Romans 12 if possible so far as it depends on you live peace, peaceably with all that's a restoration process that we talked about at first beloved never avenge yourselves leave wrath uh, uh, leave it to the wrath of God for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord this concept of I'm leaving people to God I'm handing them over I'm trusting him to do whatever he chooses to do with them 
I'm not telling God what to do with someone. You need to do this to them. How many of you ever got a good prescription of what they should do to someone? Or at least you felt like it. He's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Just literally leave them with me. Just leave them. Let me take care of it. Whatever it is, trust me. I know how to take care of people. Maybe my vengeance is a way to restore them to the family of God, to you, to spiritual health with me. And you're like, no, I just want you to judge them. No, I, I might restore them. The first goal is restoration. How many of you get that? The first goal is restoration. And if we can't do that, the second goal for us is freedom in our hearts and un, is forgiveness, right? And freedom. He wants you to live in freedom. And so today, all across the room, I want us to bow our heads for prayer right now with every head bowed and every eye closed. In your own moment, in your own way, if you'd say, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do this. In the release moment, I'm going to ask us, if you're comfortable with doing this, to take a physical step out of your seat in a moment and to literally come in a way, bring that person their name and the offense. Those two things, the name and the offense. And kneel for just a moment at the altar and just say, Lord, I leave this person at the altar, at the front of the church, I leave them with you. My offense, my anger, my woundedness, the way they've hurt me, I'm not gonna carry this out of this place. I wanna carry love and grace and forgiveness. Yes, there may be a time of separation relationally because of the consequences while we're waiting for truth to happen and restoration to happen, but I'm not gonna carry anger and offense. I'm going to release. Not everyone's comfortable coming to the front. I understand that. If you're not, then take both hands and offer them up, like lifting them up. You know, like I'm handing them over to here. Jesus, they're yours. I'm not carrying the person and the offense out of the room. Whichever one will be most meaningful and help you the most to be freed. When we begin to pray, maybe you need to come down for a moment to the altar and say, I lay the heaviness and the burden of this person's offense with you. I leave it here at the altar. I believe this is so important. Sometimes these physical responses, Jesus said, if you have ought against someone, you remember uh, someone that you have offense against and has offense against you, then go to the, leave your gift there at the altar, go to the person, but it's a physical response. It's a get up and go, get up and move, do something, act on it, act on grace, act on forgiveness. So as I pray, one of two things, let's lift that person up and hand them over to Jesus. Or let's just quickly make our way to the front and lay it down at the altar and say, Jesus, I cannot carry this burden any longer of unforgiveness, this wound. I cannot carry it. It's too heavy. It's not right for me to carry it when I've been forgiven so much. As I pray, make your move. Let's pray now. Jesus, all across this room, we're making a move and we're handing people over to you and we're entrusting you, Lord. We're leaving them with you. We've carried a heavy burden, Lord, and I know it's unforgiveness and we don't even want to say it because it feels bad to say it, but it's true. And we're a little ashamed and a little embarrassed that we know as Christians we're supposed to be forgiving, but it's hard and it's heavy. It just didn't come quickly for us and it's been lingering. The wound has been lingering. The heaviness has been lingering. The unforgiveness keeps coming out in little conversations and thought patterns that we have and our feelings towards them. Lord, we just, we need to be done. We need to be freed. So Lord, for a moment, we picture the 10,000 talents that you died on the cross to pay for every sin, the lifetime upon lifetime upon lifetime of sin, death that we owe. Jesus, you paid that price on the cross for our sins. Will you please forgive us today of our sins and we let go of the throat of the person that has sinned against us. We'll no longer try to take their life and their relationships and their reputation and the things that make life life. We'll no longer try to take that from them. But Lord, we recognize the forgiveness we've received. And so we release others. We forgive others. Just as we have been forgiven, we forgive, Lord, freely and fully. But we know it costs you a great price to forgive. 
And Lord, we know it will cost us to forgive. We'll have to let go of our right to vengeance and our right to repayment and our right and the justice we wanted to see served. We're letting go of that and we're trusting it with you because you're the judge. You will take care of these things. And now with heads bowed all across the room, if you'd say, I'm not yet a Christian and I hold on to the sin of my life and I have not accepted Jesus as payment for my sins, but today I would like to ask Jesus to forgive me for every sin that I've ever carried in this life. He paid the price for your sins on the cross when he died for your sins, but you have to say, Jesus, I believe you paid the price for my sins and I want you to save me from my sins. I don't wanna be separated from you in hell for all eternity. I wanna be close to you. Sin separates, but grace brings together. My sin has separated me, but your grace will bring me back to God. If you're here, you'd say, Matt, I'd like to pray that prayer. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise a hand and say, Matt, would you lead me in the prayer? And I'll, I'll just lead you in a prayer right where you're standing, wherever you are. If you're here and you'd say, I need Jesus to forgive me, would you raise your hand real high and say, I need to be forgiven, I need to be a Christian. Hands are going up across the room. Church, would you pray with everyone that just raised their hand right now? Let's all pray together. Everyone in the room will support everyone that just raised their hand. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of my sins. I believe you're the Son of God. Come to earth. You lived a sinless life so that you could pay the price for every sin. I ever committed. I believe in you. I ask you to forgive me and to save me. And I surrender. My future is yours. I'll follow you. I'll live for you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Amen and amen and amen. Would you give a hand for all those that prayed with us today? Amen. So here's what your pastor did. He preached too long and the parking lot's filling up. So as they play the next song, God bless you as you run for your cars. No. Have a great Sunday. I'll see you next week. Take care, everyone.